Welcome to other place. Today I'm going to talk about asthma. And I just want to give you guys a quick overview of asthma so that when you see any questions, uh, you can be able to focus and answer it correctly. It's a broad topic, but I want to let you pay attention to the most important stuff about asthma, things you need to know to be able to answer these questions. Asthma is a, a reactive airway disease. Um, what it means is you, you have, if this is your lung, and the lung is here, it's a reactive airway disease. So it's not the lung itself, but it's the tubes that are connected. And these tubes, that's the trachea, bronchial coming, you can have, um, the smooth muscles there um, can get into trouble. You can have, you will have inflammatory process that can trigger um, this upper airway issue and the smooth muscles surrounding the, the trachea and the bronchial uh, will contract. So you have smooth muscle contraction and, and these lead to bronchial constriction, constriction um, of the airway, and then the airway swells up. So that's the pathophysiology. You have some allergen or something triggering some inflammatory process. These inflammatory process will cause the muscles to contract, causing constriction. And then they swell up, leading to the point that you will not be, and then they block the airway, so you have and an obstruction going on that air can does, doesn't go into the, the the lung itself um and that is the pathophysiology so when you understand this it make it easy to answer questions so you have an inflammatory process triggering um constriction of the um of the smooth muscles such that uh, you have swelling of these smooth muscles and causing uh, and, and blockage uh, of the upper airway. And so patient always present with aspiratory wheezing, not an inspiratory wheezing. When you see an inspiratory wheezing, that is obstruction. That is something somebody have swallowed something that is completely blocked or choking. When you choke, you have inspiratory wheezing. But when you have asthma, they have aspiratory wheezing. That is their problem. So be careful. When they give you inspiratory wheezing, that is a choking phenomenon. Or you have a foreign body obstruction of the upper airway. Asthma present, it can present in acute form. Um, and most of the time in an acute flare-up, patient will present in a rapid labored breathing, okay? Rapid labored breathing. They will be breathing really, really fast, and they will be using the accessory muscles uh, to help them um, to take in some air into the lungs. And they, they may be tachycardic because they, they're very anxious. They worry, anxiety and they may be tachypneic um, from all the obstruction that is going on and the assets is going to be very low. These are all the signs and symptoms that you see. So somebody who come in with the acute flare of asthma may have rapid breathing and they will use accessory uh, uh, muscles. They will be tachypneic, they will be tachycardic and they will be restless the asset is very low. And as you can see, this can be a form of select or apply question. They can put it for you. But even in the new exams that they're going to do the next gen, this is what you'll be looking for to diagnose somebody with acute asthma. So rapid breathing, accessory muscle usage, tachycardia, tachypneic, all of them are signs and symptoms you should work for for patients who have acute flare-up of asthma. These are all unexpected um, findings. 
before you start treating a patient with asthma, the first thing you need to know is to make sure that they're wheezing. If they're not wheezing, that is an omnion sign. Basically, they're getting tired and they're going to uh, go into respiratory and distress. Basically, they're getting tired, omnion sign. So when you see a patient who has asthma and is not wheezing, you should worry about it. So first thing you should look for, you should hear them wheezing. That is a normal finding for asthma. But if you don't hear them wheeze, that is omnion's sign. We call it silent chest. Silence chest uh, of asthma patient is really bad sign. So you should see this um, before you see, um, before the treatment, make sure the patient's wheezing. If they are not wheezing and they are, you listen to their chest and they silent, that is a bad sign for an asthma patient. That means they're getting tired and they're about to go into respiratory distress. Um, in terms of treatment, before we go on the treatment, I need you to pay attention to something. You know, you have two lungs, okay? You have two lungs. And your heart, you have only one heart. There's these receptors called beta receptors. The heart has one, so it has beta one receptor. The lung has two lungs, so you have beta two receptors. There are um, chemicals like medication that bind to these receptors. Some bind to beta one, some bind to beta two. So when it comes to treatment of asthma, you have to pay attention to these uh, medications. The treatment for the asthma, um, as we already talked about, it, based on the pathophysiology, you have bronchospasm, okay? You have inflammation. So, and you have constriction due to smooth muscle. So you want to target all of this. The bronchospasm coming from, um, this is because of the smooth, smooth muscles. So you want to tackle these smooth muscles. That's why you take a beta agonist to a, open the, a, to relax the smooth muscles. You can, and then, the smooth muscles can all be also be uh, taken care of using anticholinergic, which can bind to them and take care of the, the smooth muscles. The inflammation, usually you use steroids to take care of the inflammation. So the medication for asthma treatment is you need beta agonist. Then you need steroid. Then you use anticholinergic. The anticholinergic and beta agonist, they just opening the airway for you. And then the steroid will take care of the inflammation. Then you can give them oxygen. So they get beta agonist. They get anticholinergic, they get what? Oxygen, and they get steroid. What have I done? Select or apply. So treatment for a patient in acute asthma need a beta agonist, which is a buterol. We'll go into that and talk about that um, you know, with short acting and long acting, and then they need anticholinergic, usually the epitropium, epitropium, and then you give them oxygen and you give them steroid for their asthma. And this is all you can, they can give you this um, 
select or apply which are the medication you need for acute asthma treatment, and this is what you use. Let's come back to um, and, and these receptors, beta 2, beta 1. So the abutyrol bind to beta 2 is a beta 2 organism. So you bind to that and it relaxes the smooth muscle and it allow the, uh, the upper airway to open. The anticholinergic also do the same thing and to help with the management of uh, the asthma. And then, uh, then the steroid take care of the inflammation, then you give them an oxygen. What I need you to pay attention to is um, the side effect of ab abudrol. They like asking that. Um, because it's a beta agonist, when you give anybody abudrol, you to expect their heart rate to go up. You should expect them to have palpitation. You should expect them to not be able to sleep, insomnia, because they keep them awake from increasing, ramping up everything. Heart rate goes up, palpitation. And but one thing most people forget is abutyrol can be used for high potassium. So if your potassium is high, Abutyrol can push potassium in. So abutyrol can cause hypokalemia. And so pay attention to that. They can also have tremors. So you see, these are expected finding for a patient who is on abutyrol. This is a classic question for select or apply um, question about when you give a, um, abutyrol to a patient what do you expect? These are signs and symptoms of abutyrol. They will have increased tachycardia, palpitation, insomnia, and then hypokalemia and tremor. This, I don't want you to memorize it, but think about it. It's a beta agonist, so it binds to it, so it stimulates the beta agonist and it increases your heart rate. You start feeling palpitation and then uh, insomnia. And then, uh, um, like I said, this is classic for, you can use this for hyperkalemia. Uh, so it decreases your potassium level. And then you become, you, you, um, they, they also have tremors. So whenever you give a patient this medication, you spread them to, to be tachycardic. Don't, free, uh, don't, don't worry too much about it. If you give it to them, don't worry too much about it because that is expected finding and expected when you give them a abutyrol. The epitropin, which is an anticholinergic, usually look for dry eyes, dry mouth, constipation, and urinary symptoms. Every time you give anybody anticholinergic, they, they are, they dry eyes, so they have glycoma, you should avoid it, uh, and dry mouth, and then um, constipation, it slows down um, the gut, and then urine retention. These are also classic anticholinergic signs and symptoms that they can ask you for select or apply question. Now, I put SAB and LAB. This is short-acting beta agonist and long-acting beta agonist. The short-acting is abutyrol. In acute stage, we use abutyrol, which is a short-acting. It acts right away. It's a rescue medication. The somatorol is used for long-acting. So when you they give you a SATA question about acute asthma, don't pick this. This is a long-acting um, beta agonist. Uh, we're looking for short acting, and abutyrol is a short acting beta agonist. No, no, the long having beta two receptor. And then the long having, um, yeah, the heart having beta one receptor. Okay. This is the long because we have two longs. 
we have something we call beta blockers that block these receptors, beta one and beta two. There are some that are selective that can bind only either beta one or beta two. There are some that are non-selective, they can bind both. You have to be careful if the patient is an asthmatic and he's thick and also has blood pressure problem and you give giving them a beta blocker, you want to give them beta selective, beta selective blocker so that it doesn't block the, um, the, the, the beta one, a beta two receptor in the lung and that co can cause a bronchospasm. The way to remember these beta blockers is I've used this term, BAM. These beta blockers are selective and therefore they are safe in asthma patient. You can give it to asthma patient. Bisoprolol, atanolol, and metropolol are very good beta selective agonists. And so if patient is as asthma, and also has blood pressure problem and you need to give them a beta blocker, you should give them one of these BAMs. Uh, Bisoprolol, Atanolol, or uh, Metropolol. Don't give them Propanolol or Nadolol. These are non-selective beta uh, blockers and they will block beta-2 receptors on the lung and they will cause beta and bronchospasm. So asthma patients, if you have to give them a beta blocker, you should give them a beta selective, and that is uh, those from the BAM section. They like asking that question, and this may be a question who, uh, they will ask you, what do you question? Or a selector apply. A patient who is who has asthma is on uh, uh, another law, you should be careful. That is not a good choice, and that patient should not be on it. Um, the, the, the next one we will talk about is other medications that you should um, be careful on an asthma patient. Asthma patients um, avoid NSAIDs. NSAIDs um, can cause nasal polyps in asthma patient and about 20% of asthma patient can cause bronchospasm uh, because of its anti-inflammatory effect. And therefore you should avoid NSAID in asthma patient. Once again, NSAID should be avoided in asthma patient because 20% of them can react with it and it can cause nasal polyps and make um, the asthma way. So you should avoid NSAID from asthma patient. Another medication you should also should avoid is mucumis. Mucumis can be used to break down mucus. They can give it to cystic fibrosis uh, patients or somebody who have tick secretion. Um, but so it's common. You can use it to clear secretion. So people think asthma patients should also get it. They can put it in nebulizer. You should avoid mucumis. Acetylcysteine, that's the another name call it. Acetylcysteine, mucumis should be avoided in asthma patient because it causes bronchospasm. So we have three medications you should remember. Non-selective beta blocker, NSAIDs, and mucumist should be avoided in asthma patient. Then anybody who has an asthma, you should teach them to avoid triggers like allergies, smokes. So the parents should be taught about triggers to avoid trigger. The, they also should be taught to have an inhaler with them, a rescue medication, a all the time. The other thing too you should know is peak flow. 
which they like asking a lot. So peak flow, peak flow um, is usually used to gauge whether your asthma is treated well. And um, and there's two, three types of zone. There's the red zone, the yellow zone, and green zone. Okay. And so basically, this is something you blow out. You don't blow in. You blow out and that will see if there's an obstruction. And so what if you have green zone, um, that means you can pull up to 80% and above. And that means your treatment is good. Whatever you're taking, you should continue to take it. Yellow zone is um, 50 to 79. If you are in this zone, that means you need to modify your medication. So you need to see your doctor to modify your medication. A red zone is 50 or less. That means that patient need to take the abutro and then go to emergency room because they are going to have an acute flare. So you have red zone, yellow zone, and a green zone. You always want to be in the green zone. So this is a summary of asthma. Of course, you should pay attention. Sometimes they ask questions about oral candidiasis. Remember, abutero inhaler is not the cause of oral candidiasis. It's the steroid, inhaled steroid, which is responsible for the uh, candidiasis. That's why when they use inhaled steroids, they have to wash their mouth so that they can prevent oral trash. But it's not due to albuterol. The other thing too that they like to ask is A before S. So you have to open the airway before you give them inhaled steroid. That's why you give them albuterol or anticholinergic, all of them in her form, then they can take the steroid. So it's abutero before the steroid treatment. Um, this is a summary. Of course, there's other medications, anti leukotriene medication that can also be used uh, in asthma. Basically, that is anti-inflammatory. Those are long-term. And then, of course, you have trophilin, which is also a, a bronchodilator and anti-inflammatory, which is, which is um, we, I will do a video about it, is one medication with, with a lot of side effect and therapeutic range very short, and you have to know about it. But basically, this is the brief summary of asthma, what you should expect and then uh, uh, it, 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 you'll be able to answer questions about this easily without any problem. So I have a you were questioned. Um, we'll, we'll just do one or two questions and then uh, you see how you can apply this easily. So for your test, you always try to read the last portion of the question and so that you know what the examiner is asking you and then read the scenario. Which situation will prompt the nurse to clarify the prescription? So we're talking about clarification of prescription, prescribed treatment with the air care provider. So they say the nurse is preparing medication for four clients in respiratory medical surgical unit, which situation will prompt the nurse to clarify, there's clarification. That means the patient is getting wrong medication. So we go through it. A client with bronchospasm who is due to receive nebulized acetylcysteine. This is mucromist. This is what I told you, asthma patient should avoid mucromist. So you got to question this. A COPD patient due to receive PO steroid. You remember COPD is a reactive airway disease. Therefore, uh, um, 
uh, when it says COPD, it may be asthma, so they can get steroid is okay. So this is okay. A client with cystic fibrosis due to receive PO pancreatitis with breakfast. Patient with cystic fibrosis, they cannot, the pancreas cannot secrete their enzyme due to loss of um, chloride channel. And therefore they need the exocrine uh, enzymes with food. So this is okay. A client with suspected bacterial pneumonia is due to receive IV lipofroxacin. If, if you don't know what it, this is, you know patient has pneumonia, these sound like antibiotic, that is not the problem. So therefore our answer should be, number one, asthma patients to avoid uh, mucumist. Let's try another one. The same thing. A nurse is assessing a child who has been treated with acute asthma exacerbation. Which client assessment is best indicator that the treatment has been effective? So you're looking for something that shows treatment has been effective. So best indicator, circle it and it's effective. So I'm looking for effective treatment. But what happened? The situation, the patient has acute asthma exacerbation. We went through somebody with acute asthma exacerbation, need a beta agonist, need a steroid or inhaled steroid, need a um, anticholinergic inhale, and need an oxygen. Usually you expect them to be wheezing before treatment. So after you treat them, one said episode of spasmodic coughing has decreased. This does not show that effective treatment, uh, 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 there has been effective treatment. Most of the time, as we, it doesn't correspond with a patient who uh, is asthmatic. Most of them are, will be wheezing. So that's what you'll be looking for. No wheezing are audible on chest auscultation. This is a problem. Asthma patient who doesn't have wheezing is a silent chest. You should still hear wheezing when you treat an asthma patient. If you don't hear any wheezing, they are about to go into respiratory distress. So we will take this out. Oxygen saturation has increased from 88 to 93. I told you about signs and symptoms. They are tachycardic, they are tachypneic, their SAT is low, they are diaphoretic, and when you treat them, all of them get better. And therefore, I expect it's SAT to go up. Peak respiratory flow rate has dropped from 212 to 170, 127. You should expect the peak flow rate to increase after asthma treatment because it tells you how best is their treatment and therefore number three is the best answer. Let's see if we have any more questions. We, this is a long question, but we're going to analyze it and don't be afraid of these long questions. What he's asking you is a client with bronchial asthma and sinuses has increased wheezing and decreased pre flow rate. So there's exacerbation. During the admission interview, the nurse reconcile medication and note which of the following over-the-counter medication taken by the client that could be contributing to increase asthma symptoms. So you have an asthma patient who also has sinus. So probably is taking medications that is exacerbating the asthma. So you're doing medication reconciliation. What can you, you're looking for medication that should be avoided in asthma. 
And I told you there's three types of medication, non-selective beta blocker, um, NSAIDs, and mucumis, acetylcysteine. So guafenazine is not one of them, and therefore we are okay with that. Ibuprofen, which is NSAID, is our culprit. So this should be our answer. This antihistamine, it does not affect asthma. It's not one of those medications. And of course, vitamin D is not one of those medications. So as you can see, they can treat you. Lorotidine is H2 block, antihistamine, and then uh, guafenazine. Uh, all of them doesn't affect asthma, except these three. NSAID, non-selective beta blocker, and a mucumist. And therefore, no matter two is the right answer. And you can see 36 people choose guanfenazine, which shouldn't, um, a, a, a mucinous, which shouldn't, um, a, 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 there's difference between um, a, a, a mucumist and guanfenazine. Guanfenazine usually lets you um, cough it out. So it's a spectorant. Um, but anything that break down the mucus, which is mucumist, is different. So uh, that is different from, they put it there to confuse you, but it's not mucumist. And therefore, that's the right answer. Let's see if we can do this last one, and I uh, will let you guys out. Um, so you, we have a SATA question. I will do videos on how to answer SATA questions. SATA questions are easy. Most of them is signs and symptoms, or you are educating these patients, or you're looking for diagnosis, or something that they're doing that is inappropriate. But remember, all the signs and symptoms, education and diagnosis, all come down to pathophysiology of the medical problem. Example, asthma, I told you about the pathophysiology. You have an allergy causing inflammation process. This inflammation process causes bronchospasm from the smooth muscle overreaction and it causes airway obstruction. And so you have to target and target all these pathophysiology. You don't have to memorize this. So when you're educating them, you know it's an allergy, so they can worry about signs and symptoms. You educate them to avoid all these problems. You educate them to know about their peak flow and everything. So this will help you answer such questions easily. So we have um, a client with the history of degenerative arthritis is being discharged home following an exacerbation of COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This involves an asthma. After reviewing the discharge medication, the nurse should educate the client about which topics. So patient is being discharged and you planning to educate them about which topic in terms of medication. So this is the, let's look at medication they're going on with. So they're going on with albuterol, which is a beta agonist, a beta two agonist. They're going on with the prednisone, uh, steroids, um, they're going on with, and they are they're on NSAID because of, because of the arthritis, and they're going on with the anticholinergic. So these are medications you use for asthma. I will, so we have anticholinergic, we have NSAID, we have steroid, and a beta blocker. So you have to have it back of your mind to answer this question. The way to answer such a question is just Look at each question, start from the top, look at each question and make a decision, say whether it's yes or no, but it has to satisfy the question they're asking you, the information they've given you. So every question has to satisfy the key information in the question. So you, you want to know whether you have to educate this patient what they need to do about these medications. So dryness of the mouth and throat may occur. 
And when we look at our medication, we have an anticholinergic, which causes dry eyes, dry mouth, constipation, urinary symptoms. Therefore, this is right. Ringing in the ear in an is, is, a, is expected. Transit side effect. Remember, the patient is going on with naproxen, but they're trying to trick you. Ringing in the ear is called tendonitis. The medications that your examiners like to ask you about ringing in the ear is usually aspirin, gentomycin, lasix, all the antobomycins, all the antibiotics that have the mycins, uh, and even vancomycins. Sometimes they can cause um, hearing problem or toxicity. And therefore, um, you think of aspirin, gentomycin, sobomycin, laces. You get hearing uh, ringing in the ear when you, 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 uh, you're giving it too fast. And uh, laces and vancomycin, the same thing. And therefore, pay attention to these medications. Um, NSAIDs, especially naproxen, doesn't cause that. Um, and naproxen doesn't have acetylcysteine in it. It's because of the acetylcysteine in the aspirin. And so they're tricking you. Patient is not on uh, aspirin, it's not on gentomycin, tropomycin. Uh, it's not on vancomycin or laces, and therefore this is wrong. This is the wrong answer. They're tricking you. A butyrol canister should not be shaking before use. Remember, it's an inhaler, so you got to shake it before you take it. So this is wrong. The air care provider should be notified if stool are black and tarry. This is a difficult one. They give you a naproxen, okay? Patient is on naproxen. Naproxen can cause, it's an NSAID, so it can cause gastritis. And it can also cause ulcer. They can bleed. But this can be made worse if you're on steroid. Steroid also causes gastritis. That's why anybody on steroid, you should worry about GI bleed from gastritis. So we give these patients PPI to protect um, them from having this uh, GI bleed. Therefore, a client, a air care provider should be notified if you have two that are black and tarry. Black and tarry is upper GI bleed. We call it melanin, a melana. And then therefore, a patient should be educated about that because he's taking naproxen, and he's taking steroids. Trotropium capsule should not be swallowed. This is a tricky one. Remember, this is an asthma COPD patient and he's inhaled. Most of the medication is inhaled unless it's severe attack that they get IV steroid. So it's an inhaled anticholinergic. This is put in the inhaler and they inhaled. Even though you should not chew uh, a, 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 um, even though most uh, capsules should be swallowed, this one should not be swallowed. It's tricky, but capsules should be swallowed. They should not be chewed. Um, this one can be cannot shouldn't be swallowed. It should be put in the inhaler and then inhale. And so let's see if we get them right. So this one, that one, that one. And 52 people get it right, so we get it. So this is a summary for asthma. Um, I hope you like this video. If you like it, just um, like it for me and then come back and get more stuff. Good luck on your exams.